the earliest collection of Benedictus Domino chants was copied inconspicuously on a flyleaf of a manuscript now in Brussels. It was copied in the 10th century. On this and the surrounding leaves, the collection is accompanied by a great number of other contemporary editions, some of which were themselves copied by the Benedictus Domino scribe. The editions are so numerous that the Latin paleographer E. A. Lowe has written that the leaves are covered with scribbles. The so-called scribbles comprise a range of liturgical materials and Latin poetry, as well as evidence of more elementary pedagogy. The collection of Benedictus Domino chants is important for understanding the early history of the Benedictus Domino versicle. The versicle Benedictus Domino and its response, De Gratias, concluded many of the daily office hours and were used also at the end of Mass in penitential seasons. Nonetheless, the melodies to which the texts were sung remain understudied. Michel Oglo has argued that, like the four items that comprise the ordinary of the Mass, the Benedictus Domino experienced a rapid expansion in its melodic repertory in the 11th century, but his account the 10th century remains almost unmentioned. The collection of chants in the Brussels manuscript might allow us to trace some part of this earlier history. Nonetheless, in this paper, I should like to focus on something else. The material copied on the Brussels flyleaf, the Benedictus Domino chants, but also the other liturgical chants and the poetic material, might allow us better to understand the contexts in which the Benedictus Domino circulated and the ways in which the written tradition of this chant came to be consolidated. In Uglo's account, the earliest written traces of the Benedictus Domino were copied in the margins and other blank spaces of books designed for different purposes. Only from the 11th century do we find the chant included in the original contents of some mainstream liturgical books, beginning with prosas and tropas, and later including also antiphonas, graduals, and processionals. Anne Walters Robertson has nuanced this account, emphasizing the unwritten parts of the tradition, but her description of the chant's written consolidation is similar in outline. Both authors maintain that the earliest stages of the written tradition were haphazard. The chants were simply copied uh, individually or in small groups in the available space in some old book. The choice of manuscript was not important. Right. The collection of materials on the flyleaves of the Brussels manuscript shown here suggests something different. It is possible to trace contiguities among the materials added here, which suggest not only why the material was copied together, but also why it was copied in this book rather than any other. Moreover, by allowing us to glimpse the interests shared amongst a community of scribes working during the decade of liturgical experimentation that followed the Carolingian Renaissance, the Brussels materials allow us to situate the Benedictus Domino chant within a longer narrative of music history. Putting this material together is not easy. While there is now a substantial literature on manuscript editions made in the Carolingian and surrounding periods, this work is focused almost exclusively on commentary materials and materials more directly related to the major contents of the books in which they're found. The kind of material found in the Brussels manuscript has received little attention and is often written off as pen trials or simply, as we've seen, as scribbles. In the Brussels manuscript, we have further difficulties of localization and date. The manuscript was copied for Soissons and has an early Soissons provenance. There is some similarity among the hands that added material to its flyleaves in the 9th and 10th centuries, and it therefore seems likely that these hands were working at a single center and that that center was Soissons, although this remains only uh, the most probable of several possibilities. Moreover, the relatively long span over which the materials were added to the flyleaves, something like 100 years and perhaps a little more, makes it difficult automatically to read one edition against another. But what could an edition made in the 10th century tell us about one made decades earlier in the 9th. The material has an almost irresistible tendency toward fragmentation. In order to get to grips with the additions to the Brussels manuscript, I shall therefore adopt a concentric approach. By this I mean that I shall consider in turn the Benedictus Domine chants themselves, the other material added by the Benedictus Domine scribe, and finally the rest of the material added to the flyleaves. Each layer allows a richer contextualization of the Benedictus Domine chants while necessarily introducing a certain amount of conjecture. The conclusions that are possible through such an approach are indicative rather than definitive. We will be able to suggest contexts in which the chant may have circulated without being able to prove that it did indeed circulate in any one of them. Nonetheless, so long as this is well understood, the exercise is a valuable one. The work of the Benedictine Domino scribe can be recognized by their idiosyncratic text and by their notation. The scribe copies three Benedictine Domino chants from folio three recto, which is squeezed between earlier material that has now been erased and the bound edge of the leaf. They are written upside down. I wish to make only a few brief observations about the chants themselves. The first is that there are three different melodies and that the melodies are arranged on the page from the simplest to the most decorated. This intersects with Hublot's narrative in two ways. First, the organization of this material is typical of some early collections of parts of mass ordinary, such as Curie's. This perhaps enriches the connection formed by Hublot between the melodic expansion of the mass ordinary and that of the Benedictus Domino, suggesting other ways in which the bodies of material might be related. Secondly, one might be tempted, following Hublot, to see here a simple 
original melody to which two further melodies have been added, reflecting a later stage in the development of the tradition. Here we should be cautious. There is no easy way to distinguish such layers, especially when this is one of the very earliest musical records. It is equally probable that the material is all contemporary, reflecting the different requirements of different kinds or levels of liturgical celebration. We might also note that one of the melodies was borrowed from elsewhere in the chant repertory, namely from the responsory chant Pretiosa Stormi Dionysius. The retexting of melismatic portions of other chants to produce new Benedictus Domine settings has long been recognized as a feature of the tradition. Indeed, it seems to have been the major way in which new melodies were introduced. Here, we need only note, therefore, that the borrowing of material from Matins responsories was happening from very much earlier in the tradition than assumed by Hublot, and that the melodic tradition of the chant may therefore have been richer in the 10th century than he was prepared to admit. The Benedictus Domine scribe also copied some parts of the texts of three processional antiphons across parts of folio three and four recto. The antiphons were likely copied at the same time as the Benedictus Domine chants, since they share the same unusual position and orientation on the page. It is possible that the splitting of this material across two folios suggests the development of the collection as it was copied, but it might also be that the scribe simply turned the page once they had run out of space. The liturgical designation of this material seems to have been an important factor in its collection. The two antiphons copied on folio 4 recto are enclosed by the rubric voluti item, meaning, for example, likewise, suggesting some kind of equivalence between them. This equivalence seems to be one of liturgical designations since the two chants share a rubric in at least one contemporary collection. Uh, Dei Herusam, the second one copied there, is widespread among the graduals of the 9th and 10th centuries. The circulation of this chant in both Eastern and Western sources suggests that it was long part of the established chant repertory. And this in turn may suggest why, alone among the material copied by the Benedictus Domine scribe, it was copied only as an incipit and without notation. In these books, the chant is listed as an antiphon for use in processions involving relics, that is, ad reliquias de Ducenda. In Nomine Domini, has a much more limited circulation among this book. It is in fact found in only one, the Antiphone de Montpano, and here it is included among the Jerusalem in a list of antiphons at Cruces Reliquias Quae Dedicandas, that is, for the procession involving crosses and relics. This book was copied in the same area of northeastern France, and at about the same time as the Bernard Camus Domino scribe was working in the Brussels manuscript. It is therefore possible that the combination of these two chants reflects a local tradition. The third antiphon, Cum Benemus Ante, stands further apart. It is the only one of the antiphons to be copied on folio 3 recto, and as such it is not enclosed within the same rubric. Moreover, there are other possible reasons for its inclusion here. A scribe working most likely in the 9th century uh, had already copied the incipit of the antiphon at the top of the page, and it is possible that the Bernard Comus Domino scribe was responding to this when they copied the same chant themselves, so it's the middle line. Up on the top right corner. Nonetheless, a look at other early sources suggests other possibilities that may allow us more richly to contextualize the material found in Brussels. The earliest record of this chant reported in the literature is the 10th century tropa of Paris, uh, BNF, lap 1240. The chant is copied on folio 88 recto among a gathering of later and miscellaneous editions, the liturgical purpose of which is not present well understood. Two previously unreported sources should also be examined for the context that they lend to the Brothels manuscript. Cambridge Corpus Christi College Parker Library 193 is an early copy of Ambrose's Hexoemeron and was likely also copied at Swasson and shares an early Swasson provenance. The final folio that's integral to the manuscript is covered in the same kind of material that we have seen in Brussels, again copied in the 9th and 10th centuries. This includes notated hymn and shepherds, psalm quotations, and other liturgical material. At the bottom of the verso, we find the notated and shepherd of the procession antiphon cum venomous ante. The text and melody match the version found in Brussels. A little low on the page and written by a different scribe, we find the words in nominate domini. Of course, there could be many sources for these words and they need not have any connection to the processional antiphon reported in Brussels, but the coincidence is nonetheless curious. Most importantly, it should be noted that the material found here was not copied by accomplished scribes. The repeated copying of the same few texts, as well as the repeated single letters found at the bottom of the page, suggests that it may be the work of student scribes learning to write. The possibility that the processional antiphons circulated among the more junior members of the monastic community will be explored in greater detail below, but it is striking to find it anticipated here. A second early manuscript returns us to a consideration of liturgical designation. Angers Bibliothèque Municipale 91 is a sacramentary copied in the 10th century, likely at the Cathedral of Saint-Pierre in Angers itself. A chance at each mass are written out before the relevant texts and are notated in Breton notation. The manuscript contains six chants of the Litania Maya on the 25th of April, beginning on folio 149 recto. These are followed by a single antiphon for use in processions involving relics, namely Cum Venelimus Ante, as we can see. This antiphon was therefore known somewhere with the same liturgical 
liturgical designation of Dei Jerusalem and in Nomine Domini, and it is possible that it was known also to the Brussels scribe in that context. So as we've seen, liturgical designation was important to the Brussels Bernard Thomas Domine scribe. The collection of processional chants, according to their liturgical designation, was also typical of graduals produced in the 9th and 10th centuries. So while it is therefore possible that the scribe copied Companamus Ante in response to the earlier edition of the same chant, it is also possible that they were following what was for them a familiar model. We might wonder, therefore, whether the concern for liturgical designation extends also to the Bernard Camus Domino chants themselves. If this were the case, the collection would substantiate an early processional context for these chants, anticipating the later appearance of the Bernard Camus Domino in processional manuscripts. Indeed, the earliest formal record of this versicle is found in the context of the stational liturgy of the Litania Minor in the 11th century prose of Paris in that 887. While it is there accompanied by writings of the mass ordinary and by litanies rather than processional antiphons, the context of the observance is itself clearly processional. Further materials added to the Brussels flyleaves allow us to glimpse the interests of the community who owned the book in the 9th and 10th centuries and suggest some of the ways in which the book may have been used. Two strands lend particular congruency to this material. On the one hand, there is a particular interest in classical and post-classical verse that connects editions made throughout the 9th and 10th centuries, and on the other, there is the suggestion that the greater part of this material seems to have been copied in a shared pedagogical context. On the basis of these connections, we might draw the material together and suggest a meaningful context for the Benedict of Mustard Mode so the most common kind of material added to the leaves are abecedaries and repeated single letters, some of which are decorated. While some of these could be genuine pen trials, most of them seem to have been copied in a pedagogical context and reflect an elementary stage in survival training. This can be seen most clearly where a more accomplished hand has copied letters, later to be recopied by a student. Several passages of verse added to the fly leaves share the pedagogical context of the abecedaries, but extend the copying exercises from single letters to short passages of text. For example, four verses from Virgil's third eclogue are written at the very top of folio 3 verse. They were copied in the 9th century. The verses are placed centrally on the page, each beginning on a new line with a larger initial letter. The material therefore draws on conventions of layout and presentation developed in contemporary poetic manuscripts and verse collections. Immediately below this, a second scribe who seems to be a student has copied the final verse for a second time, reproducing as far as possible the presentation of the original. This was perhaps at once, therefore, a writing exercise and an introduction to Latin metrics. A second passage refines our understanding of this pedagogical context, revealing a close contiguity between the study of Latin grammar and metrics and the teaching of chant. Half of a hexameter from Virgil's second eclogue was copied by each of two scribes at the extreme outer edge of the leaf, the first letter of each copy now lost trimming. The fact that the scribes copied precisely the two and a half feet before the caesura might suggest an analytical interest in the construction of hexameters. The same two scribes also copy the final words of another processional antiphon, this one for Easter Sunday, said it angulus ad sepulchrum. The two texts are copied in much the same way, and whereas the antiphon text has a rather complicated relation to earlier and later additions to the page, it seems nonetheless clear that grammar masters were free to use chant texts in their instruction. Two further passages drawn from the chant repertory itself suggest an easy passage between chant and grammar. The full text of the antiphon Dixit Autum Dominus was copied upside down at the bottom of Folio 3 Verso, and at some point it was notated possibly by the same scribe who copied the text. The text is presented formally, beginning with a large initial letter and a majuscule A, which is an indication of genre familiar from contemporary chant books. A second and third scribe, who seem to be working together but independently of the first, draw on this edition in a pedagogical context. The former copies as much of the text as would fit onto a single line in their own slightly larger hand, reproducing the presentation of the original. This scribe introduces some slight changes or even improvements in the Latin. This revised excerpt with its improvements is then recopied by the latter scribe, undoubtedly a student. It is not clear whether this exercise was directed toward the changes in the Latin or simply the reproduction of a brief and convenient excerpt in the remaining available space. Nonetheless, a second example allows us to be more explicit. Some part of the text of the antiphon Malos Male Perdat is written on folio 2 verso. The text has been copied imperfectly in several respects, most importantly beginning with Malas in the place of Malos. The identification of this as an error occasioned uh, grammatical instruction. On the facing page, that's three recto, a brief note, which is now almost illegible, provides the correct accusative plural and nominative singular, thus drawing the chant text into the discussion of Latin declension. We should perhaps not be surprised by the overlap between grammar and chant. Margot Fassler's study of the cantor has shown that often the same monastic official was responsible for the teaching of both chant and grammar, and Susan Boynton's work on the lost hymnaries in the 11th century has shown how liturgical texts could be assimilated to grammatical instruction. Everything discussed so far was likely copied in the 9th century. Other editions of poetic material may be later, and at least one can be placed securely in the tank. 
it is possible to trace an interest in Latin poetry, therefore, throughout the entire period in question, an interest that seems to remain rooted in a pedagogical context. Two verses from the second book of Martiam Scapella's De Nuptis Philologia et Mercuri are copied on folio three verso, where they are squeezed upside down into a narrow space between earlier editions. It is possible that these verses were added for their magical interest alone, for whereas the other poetic editions are all written in hexameters, these are in a rarer lyric meter. Nonetheless, they might also indicate a further connection between poetry and song. The poem from which these verses are taken is introduced as song in Martianus's text, and its musical setting was of interest to its Carolingian commentators. Moreover, it is clear that the poem was actually sung in the Carolingian and later periods. It is notated in at least one 9th century manuscript in the first four lines, and its polyphonic performance is described in a theory text, which is likely considerably older than the 11th century date of its uh, unique surviving copy. Solange Corbin has argued that classical and post-classical verse of this kind was sung in a pedagogical context, perhaps as a way of learning Latin metrics, and this conclusion has been restated in the works of Jan Zolkowski and Sam Barrett, although the latter has remained particularly sensitive to the other contexts in which the verses may have been born. A final example seems also to reflect the pedagogical exercise. A new hexameter has been copied on folio 3 verso in the 10th century, squeezed into the remaining space to the right of the longer Eckhart's passage. The hexameter may be understood as a verse paraphrase of material from the second book of De Nuptis. Borrowed words will be cast in a new metrical position, and the rest of the verse condenses ideas from the, from the rest of Martians' poem. Uh, the verse therefore illustrates a different kind of engagement with the text beyond formal glossing and commentary traditions. So, many of the additions to the Brussels flyleaves can be understood within a pedagogical context, a context which seems to encompass both Latin verse and liturgical chant. We might therefore wonder whether the Bernard Karma's domino chants might also be placed within this context, allowing a richer contextualization of the versicle. Two points stand in favor of such a conclusion. Susan Boynton's study of monastic rules and customaries from the 11th and later centuries has shown that the Bernard Karma's domino was most often performed by children. Moreover, the fact that we have found at least one of the antiphons among contemporary pedagogical material in another contemporary manuscript from Soissons suggests that all of this material together may have belonged to the junior members of the community. Such a reading would also explain why the material was copied in this book in particular. The manuscript contains an exemplary collection of saints' lives, sermons, and simple commentary material on the four Gospels. It provides the spiritual basis for monastic observance. It might therefore be understood in some way as a book of instruction. When it is remembered that the purpose of monastic education was not in the first instance the accumulation of a certain body of knowledge, but rather the cultivation of a certain way of life, a life in which the performance of the liturgy had a central role, the presence of liturgical material begins to make complete sense. Finally, I should like very briefly to sketch how this material might be placed within a broader narrative of music history. The material gathered in the Brussels manuscript is unusual in setting classical and post-classical verse alongside liturgical experiment. The collisions between poetry, chant, and song that I have suggested suggest that this could have been productive. Is it possible to read here one prehistory of the versified song repertories that are known in musicology as the new song, the earliest layers of which comprise poetic settings of nothing other than the Bernard Thomas Domino versicle? Here too, the role of children is perhaps not incidental. Susan Boynton has argued that the role of children in singing the Bernard Thomas Domino may go some way toward explaining the experimental the character of the early new song repertory. This goes far beyond what I can show with confidence today, but it is perhaps worth considering nonetheless. Thank you.